Welcome to Traces of Victory, a podcast where I explore how entrepreneurs and leaders of our past and present forged their life paths and built businesses and livelihoods around their interests and individuality. Today, we remain in our present and we turn the clock to 2001, when a couple of friends decided to buy an RV, paint her in green, and go on a crazy road trip to interview people who built a life doing what they love, to understand how they could do the same for themselves. The road trip completely changed their lives and led to the creation of Road Trip Nation, a company that is now dedicated to capturing empowering stories that can give us the confidence and the tools to find a career that matters to us. And today, 23 years later, they have more than 12,000 interviews on their website, highlighting how some of the most influential leaders of our time built a life doing what they love. So today, I welcome to the podcast, Nathan Jebbard, co-founder of Road Trip Nation. I don't think people get the message or hear it enough that that we all struggle, that we all fail, that we're all experiencing some sense of doubt, that even when we've made it, we'll feel this like imposter syndrome. When I went to college, I thought I was gonna be a management consultant. At some point through college, I met like a consultant, a management consultant and took him out to lunch. And like it, I totally freaked out after lunch. The what happened was that simple concept of take somebody out to lunch who loves their work, ask them how they got there. As you kind of dream on an idea, you're like, well, maybe we could like travel around the country. Maybe we could make this something like do a lot of interviews. Like it just started as this simple little project of could we interview a bunch of people who love their work so that from their stories, we could write our own story. We ended up uh, leaving two weeks after September 11th, and we did a three-month road trip for 18,000 miles and interviewed 85 people. It was mind-shifting, life-altering. The idea that everybody had this like perfect curated path was so not that. I don't know why we thought that. Maybe it's like if you look at everybody's LinkedIn profiles, like everybody curates this like perfect little path of like, I did this and then I did this and I did this. It's There's no space to celebrate like, oh, I was totally lost here. Uh, you know, that's not rewarded in our society is to tell, talk about like fear and loss and wandering. It is easier to follow a well-worn path, right? Like how many people unfortunately are doctors because it's the thing that is easy and comfortable to say when you're like at the family barbecue, right? Oh, what are you studying or what are you going to be? Oh, I'm going to be a doctor. Like the second you say doctor, everybody's like, Nate's got it. He's going to, he's smart. Uh, he knows what he's doing, but what am I going to say? I like making things. I don't know what I'm going to be. Perfect example of that is one of my favorite interviews with a guy named Adam Steltzter. And he realized one day or one night going across the bridge uh, that he went consistently that each time he crossed that bridge on a different night the stars were in a different place in the sky in his own words he's like i clearly was not paying attention in school he just went one step with that question and said like i'm gonna go figure out why the stars move and it just all of a sudden he was like tuned into this interest that like propelled him to go into college, get his master's, get into engineering. He ultimately ended up getting a job at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in NASA, and he is the lead engineer on the landing system for the Mars Curiosity rover. So like somebody who landed a spaceship on another planet got their start when they didn't even know that stars moved in the sky. So I have so many questions that I want to ask you, <laughs> so many, but I want to start with something that I was thinking about today while I was walking. I want to start with, uh, um, I know that you took a sabbatical and I'm so interested in understanding why you took a sabbatical and if uh, the sabbatical that you took 
was your was a phase that you went through for your self construction phase, and what lessons have you learned from your sabbatical that um, that you're taking with you? The answer the answer might be a little less interesting as it relates to the podcast, but it has much more to do about my marriage and my family. Um, I met my wife on uh, her first day of college uh, in, I don't know, 98 or something like that, uh, 99. And so we had dated through college. And at the end of college, uh, I graduated a year earlier than her. And so um, at graduation was when I had my freak out moment of what am I going to do with my life? And that's when we took this RV and did our original road trip um, in 2001. She graduated the following year. And um, when she finished, she's like, okay, you did that road trip. That was killer. Uh, I want, let's go do the Peace Corps. Let's like move somewhere abroad. Let's invest in a community. Let's give back. And I had to be like, I love that idea and I love you, but I think that there's something with this road trip thing. You know, we had just finished the road trip and it, 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 we called it a project for years and years and years. And so it wasn't, there was no sign that this was going to become something. It was just a kind of instinctual feeling that myself and Mike and Brian all had that, that it could become something. And so um, ultimately I had kind of said to Amy, my wife, I said like, I love you, but if like the Peace Corps is more important for you, like go do it. And uh, this has been real and we can part our ways or you can hang back and we'll see what happens with this road trip thing. And she had ultimately decided to, to stay with me, which I'm incredibly indebted to her. But there was always that compromise of not having that experience of living in a foreign country. Um, and it kind of just stayed with us. And then probably it was eight years ago. So... I don't know what's that we're 25. So that's like 13 years into our time together. We had had a few kids and started thinking about, uh, you know, she feel she still very much felt like there was that thing that was missing in, in her life. Uh, and so we kind of framed it in this new context of not the two of us post-college, but the, the five of us with th our three daughters and how could we reimagine that experience? And so ultimately we came up with this idea of doing a year abroad, um, spending half of our time in Mexico, working on our Spanish, living in a foreign community. Uh, we put, we put our daughters into a local public school in Mexico where they were the outsider. Um, and you know, they had to learn to speak a foreign language and learn what it was like to, uh, yeah, just, just be the outsider. Um, so they did public school for six months and then we traveled for six months. And what lessons were you able to learn? Maybe family wise, maybe reflections that you made, even uh, regarding road trip nation, or just things that you realized, wow, I didn't think about that before. One of those is like, w there's no perfect. I think, um, and that, that relates to your career or your life, but the idea of like, if we can get just, you know, if I can have just this job or if I can pursue just this thing, my life will be perfect. Um, or living in Southern California is perfect or living in Baja California is perfect. Um, I, I think in each of the places we went and traveled to, there was things we loved about them. There was things that like weren't, weren't the best about them. And, and we were so excited to come home. Um, but we had that same feeling of like, okay, home is not perfect. You know, I, uh, I spend way more time driving. There is more concrete here than I ever would like to see. Um, but as long as I look to the West, it's a beautiful ocean and, and I'm okay. But I think the idea, I think certainly when I was younger was like, I, I felt like I was trying to achieve something like that there was this sense of perfect. And what was it for you? Oh, uh, well, I guess when I was younger, so be like in college before we started road trip, it was this idea of like doing what society had like prescribed. And so what I thought was successful was like, I don't know, some, some bullshit of like a job that makes a lot of money. When I went to college, I thought I was going to be a management consultant. And the if I could look 
it, if I really truly understood who I was and understood what management consulting was, I would realize the disconnect immediately. And I just never even was thoughtful enough about it. I literally hate wearing nice clothes. And so the idea of like working in a job that would uh, put me dressing up all the time was painful. We've talked about the ocean. Like, I think at some point through college, I met like a consultant, a management consultant and took him out to lunch. And I was like, so tell me about like uh, travel and stuff. And this guy was super into travel. And he's like, oh, you can go here. You can go there and you go this. One day you're in the middle of the country, like consulting a tire company. And the next day you're like up in New York City. And I was like, what if you want to just stay by the ocean? And he was like, well, like maybe like five, 10 years in when you build enough sen seniority, you can decide like where you want to be located. And those two things, I mean, literally it was a, it was a lunch with a guy after a career fair, man, I don't think I've talked about this in like 10 years probably, but I went to a career fair in college, met this consultant, took him out to lunch. And like it, I totally freaked out after lunch, just on those two simple things that I would have to move away from the ocean or that where I lived or worked wasn't up to me. Um, and I would have to wear a suit and tie. And this guy loved, like the guy loved his job. So I don't know, no, he was in the exact perfect place. He loved dressing up and he loved traveling any and everywhere. It just was totally incongruent with who I was as a person. And I, I never even thought about that until I don't know, my third year in college, which is ridiculous. And then what happened after you met this guy? Like what, what was the next step for you? I was kind of just freaking out. Um, I, th I, I'm going to guess it was like my second to last or last year in college. It probably was my last year in college when I was starting to think about like finding the first job. Um, and that's when like my roommate was in the similar experience. He had, spend like his whole family had a medical uh background we were like best friends from like junior high school so it's all his family were like doctors his grandpa was a doctor his mom was a chiropractor and so he really thought he was going to be doctor is a biology and kinesiology major um but he did an internship at amgen which is a pharmaceutical company and was just like holy shit i hate hospitals and our other buddy brian was um about to be third generation in a waste management business that he had no interest in. And so I think all three of us had this kind of like, oh shit moment where we just real we just realized the life we were living was not of our own making, of our own design. And so the what happened was uh that simple concept of take somebody out to lunch who loves what their their work, uh take somebody out to lunch who loves their work, ask them how they got there was what we kind of started chewing on. But then as you kind of dream on an idea, you're like, well, maybe we could like travel around the country. Maybe we could make this something like do a lot of interviews. And it was always like, it just started as this simple little project of, could we interview a bunch of people who love their work so that from their stories, we could write our own story. We could finish that road trip and come back and then go get our job. And so that was always the idea was we would do this road trip, finish it, and then come back. And so we spent about a year building the trip, cold calling hundreds and hundreds of people, similar to probably how you're putting um, the podcast together, right? It's just knocking down doors and finding people that kind of understand where you're at. And uh, so we spent a year doing it. We ended up uh, leaving two weeks after September 11th, and we did a three-month road trip for 18,000 miles and interviewed 85 people. And it was life-changing. Uh, I think like I think it only took maybe a handful of interviews before we realized like, oh, there's something here. This is bigger than just ourselves. Like we kept going to these interviews, hearing people's stories, and not only just saying, oh, this impacts me, but like, I know three or four friends back at home who have to hear what this person just said. And so from that first trip in 2001, we ultimately said in whatever form and fashion, um, we ultimately want to like commit to sharing these stories, sharing these experiences. And for the last 
we just passed like I think 22 years. Yeah, for the last 22 years, we've been committed to helping people define their roads in life by sharing powerful, meaningful stories of how others have already done it. I like what you said about taking small steps, because I think uh, that's that's how you start a project. And then hopefully this project becomes somehow successful just by taking small, small, small steps over a long period of time. And uh, you said that you kept calling in road trip, what road trip nation is today, a project for many years. When did this project become what it is today? Because I think that you coming back from, from the trip, it, I think it took a lot of gut and a a lot of uh, um, determination and self-belief to say, I'm going to commit commit 100% to this project, which was still a project at that time. So what gave you the confidence that this will eventually work in the long term? And when did it happen that finally it worked for you? Can I say it's still happening? (laughs) Still happening. Um, I mean, I think there's a question of, I think... Tell me which question you're more interested in. I think there's a difference between when did the shape of Road Trip Nation become similar to what it is today versus when did we feel enough confidence to like actually stop calling it a project and just call it exactly. Road Trip Nation. Yeah, my question is, what were those pivotal moments that happened where you told yourself, okay, I don't need to look for another job. This is what I'm doing. This is my direction in life. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was incremental. You know, I okay. think um, there was a guy we interviewed named Randy Komazar and he he said, you know, life is only linear in the rearview mirror. Mm-hmm. So now 22 years back, I can tell you, oh, it was first this and then that and then mm-hmm. this. But in the moment, it was a lot of fear, a lot of insecurity, but a sense of just I think a real true desire to like share those experiences that we had on the road. Cause it was, it was mind shifting life altering because I think when we went out on the road trip, we expected in our naivety, we expected everybody pretty much to say, Oh, I always knew I wanted to do this. And so that's Mm -hmm. what I did. I don't know why, we thought that maybe it's like, if you look at everybody's LinkedIn profiles, like everybody yeah. curates this like perfect little mm-hmm. path of like, I did this and then I did this and I did this. It's There's no space to celebrate like, oh, I was totally lost here. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, that's not rewarded in our society is to tell, talk about like fear and loss and wandering. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we got into these interviews, we realized, oh my gosh, every one of these people felt similar to us, you know, like whether they knew who they were at the start or whether they had to figure that out, they all had that sense of insecurity, you know, like, um, Howard Schultz who started Starbucks, like he, he was so poor at, in his upbringing, you know, his dad never had healthcare. He lived in the projects in Brooklyn, but like ultimately like, he was so poor in college that he was donating blood just to have enough money to, to oh. eat. Michael Dell, when he started Dell Computers, like he dropped out of college, but he was so afraid to tell his parents that he dropped out of college that he just didn't. Like he avoided the conversation. Hmm. Um, like it's just the the idea that everybody had this like perfect curated hmm. path was so not that. You know, mm-hmm. the we interviewed a engineer uh, years later. Just recently, we interviewed an, uh, an engineer at Spotify named Catalina Laverde, and she, eight years previous, didn't speak a word of English, like had never wow. been to America, like moved to America without even under the ability to to respond to what is your name. Mm-hmm. Um, but she found her way through it and she found this interest in like engineering and music and then like evolve. So, um, to get back to your question, I would say like, there was this sense of realizing that everybody's stories had these twists and turns Mm -hmm. and that was enough to sustain us in the twists and turns of road trip. But it was probably, it was probably three or four years into maybe even five years into road trip Hmm. that we, we took the word project 
off of our language. And we would say, you know, I work at mm -hmm. Road Trip Nation as, a, as opposed to, oh, I'm doing this project <laughs> yeah. called Road Trip Nation. Um, and what gave you the confidence to continue? Is it, as you said, looking at these people that at a certain point, all of them were, they were lost, but they keep, they kept, you know, working on their own thing. And eventually they were able to figure it out because five years is yeah. a long time. Like, <laughs> it's I, a long I, time. I, it's a long, long time. So for somebody to keep doing what they're doing for five years, what, what yeah. gave you the confidence to continue? I would say first I'd acknowledge the privilege that myself and my partners had, which is mm -hmm. all three of our parents were willing to let us live at their home. And so we kept our expenses Super literally long. down to almost zero. If we went out, we never went out, but if we went out to like a Mexican restaurant, this is not an exaggeration. We would buy one beer <laughs> and eat the chips and salsa. And that mm -hmm. was like going out. You know, mm -hmm. we just, we, we had, uh, when we finished the first road trip, Mike's car got impounded because uh, it got too many tickets because we didn't think about long-term parking. Um, so the three of us were sharing my T100, my mm -hmm. like 95 Toyota truck. Um, so there was some privilege in the sense that we had a support network that allowed mm -hmm. us to wander for a while. Um, but there's a chapter in the book that actually comes from a phrase my grandma used to always say, which is a drip and a drip makes a splash. And for us, a couple of those defining drips, like we finished the first road trip and, uh, we worked our asses off to get mm -hmm. press for that trip. And we got next to nothing. We got a few articles in like a local paper, but we literally got like, a, a section like that big in a, a Forbes magazine. Like it was maybe two paragraphs, a little blurb uh, where a writer had reached out um, or responded to our request to, to mm -hmm. cover a road trip. And she wrote two paragraphs and it just drip in a drip. Somebody from random house books saw that article contacted the author and said, Hey, would they ever like to write a book? And the author reached back to us and said, Hey, this person's interested. I loved working with you guys. What do you like? Let's write this together. Mm -hmm. uh, her name was Joanne Gordon. And so from our first, like coming back from the road, we were living with our parents. We invited this uh, incredibly successful writer from Forbes magazine to come to California for two weeks and live at my parents' house. And we wrote this book together. Uh, and the, the signing bonus of that book was just enough to pay our debts back. Um, and then uh, we started editing all the footage because we filmed everything on the trip. Mm -hmm. And right at the time we were starting to edit that, one of the people that we interviewed from Nike called and said, hey, I was just thinking about you guys. Like, wow. how are you? Like, literally just a check-in. Uh -huh. And we had told him, like, hey, we're writing this book and we're making this film and we'd love to, like, share this film. And he was like, I think I could get Nike to help out. And mm -hmm. so he ended up giving us a little bit of money to like finish the film and then take it on tour. And so there was a chapter where that could have been the end of the story. And between the check from random house and the check from Nike, we had just enough to do the tour, edit the, finish the film, do the tour. And then we came back with, I think we had $5,000 in our bank and like another drip. And then I'll, I'll, I'll end it here, but another drip that was, really monumental for us was that on all the press, the the questions in the orientation was like, oh, you guys are so unique. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we didn't feel that way. Like ultimately, like hmm. the way we cold called people was just ridiculous. Like I called the Supreme <laughs> Court, the highest court in the States and asked for Sandra Day O'Connor, who's the first woman Supreme Court justice from the 1-800 number on the Supreme Court website. Mm -hmm. Mike cold called Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, the director of Saturday Night Live, every three days for three months straight. Mm -hmm. And so we did these like non-skilled just hustle trying to get people to do our interviews. And we felt like anybody else could do that, that we weren't very unique. Mm -hmm. And there was some pushback to that. And I think that that pushback, this like made us say, no, like we can prove that this can happen. And so we took that last $5,000 that we had and we ripped out the back. There used to be a bathroom back there in the mm -hmm. RV. 
and we ripped that out so that we could fit five people in this RV. Um, and we put an application out to college campuses to see if anybody else would want to replicate our experience. You know, mm-hmm. we'll film it, we'll give you the keys, we'll pay for the trip, but you have to do your interviews, you find people you're interested in, mm-hmm. you basically, in your own way, replicate the trip. And we put a bunch of applications out at college campuses and we ended up finding an incredible team and just kind of put that proof out there that other people could do the same experiences mm-hmm. we could. And uh, with our last $5,000, we filmed a two week road trip or three week road trip with uh, these three guys from Brooklyn. And they did the same, like they had the same meaningful experience as we did. And so that was like this validation mark, another drip. And then we ultimately decided that like we would just commit ourselves to replicating this experience and in many fashions road trip has grown but at the core we're still doing you know 22 years later we're still putting people on their own road trips to interview people that they find inspiring and what do you think is not maybe the biggest but some of the traits that you've seen in all of these people you have interviewed until now you said 23 years 22 yeah yeah it's a lot of people (laughs) it's a lot like I, yeah. I, I looked the catalog on the website, kept scrolling yeah, and scrolling and scrolling. There's 12,000 videos in the site. It is amazing. What's also very interesting is that all of these people, all their stories are on the website. So you can literally scroll and spend a lot of yeah. time reading and following their stories. So what do you think are some of the traits that you've seen among all of these different people that make them so unique and that we, by looking from the outside, can incorporate into our own life. I appreciate the word unique, but I also don't want that to be interpreted as like, you have to be unique to find your road. I, I think we believe that there are as many paths to mm-hmm. a fulfilling you know, work life uh, as there are people in this world. So it's not something that uh, is exclusive to one group or the other. Um, but I would say at the heart of it, like in the most simple, simple way, um, people that we interviewed, they pursue their interests. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's, um, I think there's a, is an intentional nuance uh, mm-hmm. that I would flesh out, which is, um, I think a lot of people say, start with your skills and then develop a career there. Um, but I think that misses a few things. I think it's easy, uh, especially when you're young, um, it's easy to look at, at a skill and misattune that into a direction that you're really not interested in. So, um, I might be interested in, or I might be skilled with a spreadsheet, but that doesn't mean that's like what gives me joy. Right. Um, and so the other piece that it's not saying is, it's not saying follow your passion Mm -hmm. because I think the follow your passion piece, the thing that's, there's a couple things that are challenging with that. Number one is who knows what their passion is, especially Mm -hmm. when they're younger to, to us, our point of view is that's a destination. Like Mm -hmm. you pursue your interests, you build a life around your interests and you ultimately you arrive at a place where you're passionate about the work that you do. And that's similar to the skill set. Like start with something that's interesting and then you'll have the commitment and the energy to develop skills around that. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately like the most simple thing that we saw were people pursued an interest not the other way around, not a, not starting from skill set. So like a perfect example of that is one of my favorite interviews with a guy named Adam Steltzer. Mm-hmm. He, um, he was going to like junior college, um, really kind of just wandering post high school in like education. Mm-hmm. Um, he was playing in a, a, a rock band at night, uh, doing a lot of shows. And he realized one day or one night going across the bridge uh, that he went consistently that each time he crossed that bridge on a different night, the stars were in a different place in the sky. And he literally sat there and was like, the stars move like in his own words. He's like, I clearly was not paying attention in school that the the earth rotates on its axis and rotates around the sun. And you know, the stars are moving in the sky. And he, he just, went one step with that question and said like, 
I'm going to go figure out why the stars move. He took a class at his local college to understand why the stars move in the sky. And it just all of a sudden, he was like tuned into this interest that like propelled him to go into college, get his master's, Mm -hmm. get into engineering. He ultimately ended up getting a job at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in NASA. And he is the lead engineer on the landing system for the Mars Curiosity rover. So like somebody who landed a spaceship on another planet got their start when they didn't even know that stars moved in the sky. Hmm. And it wasn't that he said, oh, I'm really good in this thing. And so I'll go left. It was just the simple interest. And I think that there's so much more that I think we can put into our professional lives when we're deeply interested in them. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the surgeon that I want to operate on me when I break my clavicle is not the surgeon that went into it because it makes a lot of money. It's the surgeon that like is fascinated by the human body and pursued that interest and then developed a skill set around that interest. I just wonder if you met people that even in their 30s, they, they were still questioning sure. their direction in life or if, if if ever stops. Well, I'll start with the last question and then go to the first. Uh, I don't think it ever stops. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think so many people that we interviewed were absolutely happy with what they were doing, but were very comfortable and aware that that happiness could change and their interests might evolve. Mm-hmm. I mean... Even uh, like to, and then uh, to give you a specific example of somebody changing uh, or finding their interests later in life, we interviewed um, this guy named Tinker Hatfield. Have you ever heard of his name? No. Um, well, today he is, uh, I think, I don't know. I'm not a good, I'm not a sneaker head, but he's basically the like head of design at Nike. Um, and has designed wow. every Air Jordan for every, you know so many years. Um, there's a excellent uh, series on Netflix called Abstract, and mm-hmm. they highlight his his story. Um, but the interesting thing with Tinker is he kind of did the like skill set thing first, or did the like career that sounds like the right thing to do first. Mm -hmm. He was always interested in sports, but felt like sports was this thing you do on the side. It's a hobby. If you're not a professional, then you throw sports away. Right. And then you have to grow up. And so Mm -hmm. out of college, his grow up job was to become an architect. And so he went and he studied and then ultimately started practicing architecture. But he realized that sports was such a part of his life that he couldn't let it go. Mm -hmm. But he's already in a profession, right? He's an architect. He is on his way, but he's not happy. And ultimately what he ha- what he did was say, well, how can architecture get me into sports? Mm-hmm. And so I think that's the, the nuance of like finding your road when you're 20 and finding your road when you're 30, 40 and plus is the, the changes have to be a little bit more strategic. They have mm-hmm. to be a little bit more incremental you still have to pay rent versus live with your parents when you're yeah. you know, 30 or 40. Um, and so for Tinker, he took that architecture and just went a few degrees to the left and started doing architecture for Nike. Mm-hmm. And so he got a job doing like their Nike stores and doing the like design and architectural design for their stores, all the while expressing his interest both in Nike and sports and trying to get closer. And so he worked his way from an outside consult or an outside firm doing architecture buildings into the design department and then ultimately leading the design mm-hmm. department many years later. But it was this kind of like shift in this incremental approach. And what about you? Are you still questioning about your role in life or, or not anymore? No, of course. Well, like different things get me excited at different times, right? There was a many years at road trip, you know, the first five, 10, yeah, probably five or 10 years where, uh, I was like making like ultimately who I am. If you were to ask like who, what, what drives me, I like making stuff like that's the basis of it. Um, and so for like five or 10 years, that making stuff was making editing. And then as we grew directing our documentary series, which we still do today. 
Um, but then ultimately I had done, you know, 10 years of that and was ready to train like, uh, people to take my place so that I could move into a different space. And so I went from editing to directing to then executive producing the series so that then I could start as we also started developing, you know, web, web-based tools where people can, as you had pointed out on our website, use the content in an exploratory of way. We learned how to build websites. We learned how mm -hmm. to make online tools. We learned, you know, that first book was just the first book, but we did multiple books later. And so mm -hmm. my interest kind of expanded into product development. And so I did that for probably the next half of my time at Road Trip. Um, and then to do my sabbatical, I was able to that to make that work and do right by road trip, I had to train uh, people to take over my role. And so I mm -hmm. had split my role in half and two incredibly talented people did that job and did it so well that when I came back, everybody was like, well, that's great, Nate. Like these guys are doing great. Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> what do you want to do? And so I'm in this really unique place right now where I get to come to road trip from a poise perspective. And like, if I were to give myself a title, I would say I'm a futurist at road trip. I'm, you know, the thing that I wasn't able to do in those first 20 years was think where can road trip be in its busy, biggest, most possible sense five years from now. I never got to focus on that because I was always so heads down and just getting the work done. And so now I'm in this really exciting place where I'm thinking about it, uh, are, what's around the corner? How could, you know, specifically right now, how could Road Trip use ChatGPT and an artificial intelligence to redefine career exploration? Um, mm -hmm. So I'm deeply enjoying that. Um, but I also, you know, I still make stuff on the side. I shape surfboards from time to time, and mm -hmm. I would love to get into product design on this side or, you know, whatever. There's, there's a lot of interest that I have that'll be met years down the road. When did it become clear that that was your foundation, like making things? Was it clear from the very beginning or did it become clear later on in life? I couldn't put a words to it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I, I'd been making things or tinkering uh, with tools since I was a tiny kid, right? Like I have very old memories of just pounding nails into wood for hours on end. Um, and so in hindsight, I could look back and say, I love making things. Uh, but I was like out of touch enough that that was something to like name or take seriously to the point that when I, uh, chose a major for college, I chose management, business management, which is just ridiculous. I'd never managed a thing in my life. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I don't, well, I'll say on a personal level, uh, let's see, his signature is uh, right there. This little box is a guy named Ma Michael Jagger. Mm -hmm. And we interviewed him in Burlington, Vermont. He um, he is responsible for all the creative direction for Burton Snowboards for the first, mm -hmm. I don't know, 20 years cool. of uh, Burton and has his own design studio. Um, and his, for me, his story was life-changing because I, I knew I always liked making things, but I also wasn't that good. Like mm -hmm. if I drew you a drawing, you would say it's pretty shit. Like my 12 year old probably can draw a better <laughs> horse than I can. Right. And like, I love woodworking, but like, I yeah. wasn't going to be a master carpenter by any means. But I always had this feeling that I could look at something and get a sense of how it could be better. Mm -hmm. Like something that drives me nuts is when you walk into a building and the door has a sign that says push, mm -hmm. right? Like if that door was designed right, if the handle was designed right, if there was a clear affordance to that door, you wouldn't need a sign. Like it's a flat thing that you push or it's a handle that you pull, right? So I always had this ability to observe and I didn't use the word design because I didn't know it, but to, to deserve, observe things and think how could they be better. Mm -hmm. But I had no context of the word design and I had no context that that, that skill set was actually a job until we got to Burton Snowboards because Michael Jagger was a creative director. And so he's a creative director. He's inspiring a team of skilled 
individuals, whether that's designers or engineers or front end uh, developers to make something, but they're all more skilled than he is, but he has this larger vision that can see what it can be. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that was the first time where I ever found myself realizing that there was a career that would fit like this unique makeup of who I am, that I was Mm -hmm. somewhat skilled in a lot of different things. Um, but never felt confident or good enough to like pursue any one of those individually. Mm -hmm. Um, and ultimately after that interview, like I spent the next like 10 years evolution of road trip as we started hiring people, building myself into the role of a creative director. And that's where I spent Mm -hmm. the longest, like 10 years as a role in road trip. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm interested in, uh, these different interests that you're putting together because in the book you have, um, your foundation, and then if you combine your foundation with uh, different interests, then you come up with you can come up with your own job. Totally, I'm, I'm interested in uh, your foundation was making things, and your interest, what were they? Was it creativity? What was it? I would say, like for me, I mean, in uh, those for those of you who haven't read the book, the idea, the way we kind of separate this thing of like mm-hmm. a foundation versus your interest is the foundation is something like ultimately core to who you are. It's not something that's going to like change very often, but your interests can evolve and change. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as we were talking about in the start of the show, I was, I, I am, I've been a surfer for, I don't know, 30 odd years, but I'm getting into this new sport called foiling. So my interests are changing in that. Um, but in, from a professional standpoint, I would, I would say, uh, design and technology. Mm -hmm. Um, I love making things, but the idea that like, making physical things mixed with technology that they can come together is just incredibly fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, like it, it doesn't necessarily, I'm the same happy Mm -hmm. whether I'm designing a website or a book or Mm -hmm. building a surfboard in the garage. Right. Um, and so the idea is like the, you have this foundation that doesn't change your interests are kind of on top of that and then things evolve and they move around. But that the, the interesting part is when you mix these things together, mm-hmm. I think in, in like throughout my education, I always felt like there was this very singular, um, path that you would have to choose like, Oh, I'm going to study marketing and then I'll be a marketing person. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what's absent of that is like, where do you do that marketing? Are you passionate about like improving and changing the world? Well, marketing for a nonprofit, do you, do you like um, the environment? Like, well, market, do marketing, do social media for Greenpeace, right? Mm -hmm. Surfrider foundation. There's all these different ways in which like, you can pursue an interest and then mix another interest in there. And that's where you get that true like resonance with who you are as a person and what you do professionally is that like you embody all the things that, that are important to you and find a way to manifest those into a career. But Mm -hmm. this idea that careers are these little tiny boxes that only make up one like thing, it's just not true. What advice is, will you give somebody who's like my brother? 18 years old and he's still trying to figure out his life and uh, what advices would you give somebody my age who's 30 years old who's still trying to figure out you know his road in life i think the advice is the same i think what changes is like uh flexibility and risk tolerance um but ultimately I mean, there's a couple things to come to mind uh when you asked like why is it still the same i think I mean, I think there's maybe two kind of things intersecting in that answer. One is just the like education system. It's, it's a, it's an assembly plant, right? Like it it has to, its job is to assemble, uh, educate a massive a number of people. And it has to do that in a consistent way in the way you systematize that is you put everybody in buckets, right? And especially in Europe, like you're choosing a career path very early on, comparatively much earlier than you would be in the the US. And I think that presents a real challenge because you're as a young person choosing a path with no experience. Um, and then I think the other piece that contributes to this like disconnect is that it there's not a lot of space for people to be vulnerable, especially in a public manner. Like if I go to speak at South by Southwest conference, like 
when I put my little bio together, it's not full of all of my failures and all the times that I've like wandered. It's like all the things that sound smart, right? New York Times bestselling author. Great. Like that's what I'm going to put there. It takes conversations like this and thank God for podcasting because I think these stories are getting out more. Um, but that sense of, I don't think people get the message or hear it enough that that we all struggle, that we all fail, that we're all experiencing some sense of doubt, that even when we've made it, we'll feel this like imposter syndrome. You know, I think we don't, oh, of course. Like, I mean, I am deeply excited about the work I'm doing with understanding how Road Trip could use AI. It's so outside uh, my, like, there's no AI background. I'm not like a engineer at Google that has been working in artificial intelligence for years. Um, so I'm, I'm doing my best to stand on the skills and the experience I have jumping into a totally new space. And it feels very similar to like when we started this thing. Um, so, uh, so that's like the setting I would say is like, number one, when we're all experiencing it, just nobody is talking about it. And that was like a huge thing that we felt you know, 22 years ago on the trip was like, oh, wow, self-doubt is normal. Like wandering, like one of my favorite uh, interviews, uh, his, his quote was just um, J.P. Barlow. He was a, among many things, a founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and also a, a songwriter for the Grateful Dead, which imagine if you could put two things together that are very different. Uh, but he said, it, you're not much of an explorer if you're not lost. And I thought that that was such a perfect, like, metaphor for living life like um so the, the advice i would say just to go to the, your specific piece is that ultimately like it's you got to take the pressure off of yourself for finding the thing like f like that's why we don't say find your passion like it's just pursue an interest and don't figure out the big thing figure out the next small step you know, the one thing that would lead to the next. When we finished our road trip, we had filmed 461 hours of footage, but we had no idea how to edit. And the only thing I could do was, you know, it would have been one thing to freak out and been like, oh, we got to hire a professional, like somebody that knows what they're doing. Uh, but ultimately what I went and I went to Barnes and Noble and got a, uh, uh, instruction manual, user manual for Final Cut Pro, which was the editing software we were using at the time, and just started reading the manual on how to edit. Even before I had a computer and the software in front of me, I would go into the Apple store and and figure out like, oh, that's what I was reading about. Um, and so my next thing there was just buying that manual and starting to read and figure out how to learn to be an editor, you know, and now I don't know, we're hundreds of hours of television done. So I would say to the young person, to the old person, um, it's, it's far, take that stress off of, of finding things to be perfect. Really just find that next step that gets you closer to like a profession that is embodied in your interests. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what I'm doing with this podcast, you know. I've seen yeah. uh, this podcast called Founders. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's called Founders. It's, it's amazing, Nathan. It's this guy basically reading biographies and uh, telling all the lessons that he oh, learned cool. from the biographies. And I'm like, this is a job nowadays? So it's just yeah, incredible yeah. how with this, new, with this new media and all of these new tools, how many, how so many, how you have so many different careers that can be born by combining totally. your interest and then combining all of these different tools that you have, whether it's AI, it's podcast, you know, it's YouTube. It's just super interesting. I just have one right. more question because I'm so interested in understanding because I'm trying to define my own definition of success to me. Yeah. And I'm, I wonder what's your definition of success and if your definition has changed throughout the years. Hmm. I mean, at the highest level, I would say my definition of success is to be happy. Mm -hmm. um, and happy isn't void of like struggle and challenge, but ultimately do I feel like my time is well spent? Do I feel like uh, I'm supporting those around me? Um, but that happiness 
it shifts, right? Like when I was 20 something, like it was all about me. But right now I'm a father of three daughters. And so my happiness is very intertwined to making sure I can be the best husband to my wife and the best parent to my kids while also being deeply invested in road trip. And so that makeup shifts and evolves over time. Um, And I guess that's that other part, right? Like you don't ultimately like find that perfect career and you don't ultimately find that like perfect definition of success and then everything's static from there Mm -hmm. right like we've all heard it before the only constant is change Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of hard to accept that change is the only constant yeah because because it's hard to it's hard to tell yourself okay you know what change is the only constant so what it means is that i always have to figure out things it's a constant yep. moving of, uh, it's a constant motion. It is. But I think, I mean, just look around you right now and think how, wh- if you were to write a hundred careers that are like compelling and interesting to you right now, just mm-hmm. on a list, I don't know what the number is, but I would bet you that 60% of those careers didn't exist yeah. 15 years ago. I think it's so useful for people to to write down what's my foundation. And, and then let's try to match it with different interests that I may have. Right. For example, one of the things that I did was I'm super interested in windsurfing. So I called, email somebody who is, works uh, uh, in the windsurfing in the industry and is a cons- um, he has his own marketing agency. And he put me in contact with uh, Francisco Goya. And Francisco Goya mm. is, do you know Francisco Goya? I don't. No, he's he's one of the top. Even was, but he still is one of the best windsurfer that ever existed. Is one of wow. he was a wave uh, wave windsurfer like it was like like a champion, and he put me in contact with him, and then who knows? Maybe in the future something can happen. Totally. But it's by combining these different these different interests that you have, uh, and then just uh, as you said in the book, uh, at the end of the day, you gotta take the first step. Like you got to take action because nobody's going to give you anything. Right. And I think like the, I love that you did that and pursued, you know, your interest in windsurfing. Cause I think it's so easy for all of us to negate that interest as a hobby you do in -hmm. the four months of summer, right. That it's not, uh, professional enough. Now it's still, you still, I don't want to make this all sound pie in the sky that like you still have to be grounded in like whatever it is you have, you need an economic engine, right? You need to be able to like pay your bills and save up for, you know, the type of lifestyle that you want. But this idea of windsurfing is an interest that can intersect with podcasting, Mm -hmm. like have him on your show, then your podcast and your interest of windsurfing are intersecting. Right. Mm -hmm. We interviewed this guy named Ariel Hawani and Mm -hmm. he he described, he said in high school, he was so af- like, so shy and so afraid of like being in public that like he would hide in the bathroom when like a lot of people were, I forget what exactly of his story was, but it like, he would be conscious of like when and how he would like move around campus, just like he didn't want to run into too many people. Right. Wow. But ultimately he found mixed martial arts and was mm-hmm. like, loved this. And found that even though he was shy, he was articulate. But he ultimately pursued that interest where many people would say MMA is like a thing you do like before or after work, but not the thing you do. It is easier to follow a well-worn path, right? Like how many people unfortunately are doctors because it's the thing that is easy and comfortable to say Mm -hmm. when you're like at the family barbecue, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, what are you studying? Or what are you going to be? Oh, I'm yeah. going to be a doctor. Like yeah. the second you say doctor, everybody's like, Nate's got it. He's yeah. gonna, he's smart. Uh, he knows what he's doing. But what am I going to say? I like making things. I don't know what I'm going to be. Like all that does is bring like tension mm-hmm. into that family barbecue. Um, so I think life is structured, going back to that lack of vulnerability in a way that like we don't want to share that vulnerability We'll follow the path that's in front of us. We'll we'll do the thing that says uh, sounds the best. Mm-hmm. When I said 
I was going to be a management consultant at the family barbecue. Yeah. All that, like, what are you going to do with your life? All that shit went away. Cause it, yeah. I had something smart that, that I could say. And literally Marco, I manifested that. Like I learned the little trick that if I said, I'll do this career that sounds smart, mm-hmm. everybody will think Nate's smart. And so then I just went to college to be a management consultant. And like, if I hadn't done road trip, I would be a very disgruntled, Mm -hmm. maybe even skilled Mm because like I do like managing, like I love building a team and leading. So I probably could have done that reasonably well. And it would have been this whole, like I talked my way, like I manifested it backwards. Like I started with out of sheepishness an uncomfortability with not, with being able to say, I don't know what I'm doing. So I masked my fear wrapped it in a career that I had actually no interest in and, but sounded good at the family barbecue yeah. and then followed that. Like that's, it's, that. it freaks me out sometimes to think yeah, of like, have you, have, had you I wonder, not, like, have you ever wondered what it would happen if you never had the guts to do the first road trip? Yeah. I mean, like I said, I think I'd be a fairly un, I mean, I, I want to believe I would have like found my way to like stuff that lights me up, but I know yeah. like I don't fault anybody for like following a worn path because it's mm. it it's way less risky and some people don't have the ability to take huge risks. Um but I think we all wonder. Yeah. I think it's it's better that we all say it out loud. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you but you still have to have that entrepreneurship in yourself because at the, at the end mm-hmm. of the day you you have you gotta have because I don't think anybody can can become this person. I think some people are better off uh, just staying put because it, it takes some level of entrepreneurship and some level of uh, putting some work, like even just simple things, like uh, just this podcast. Like I got my I got a mic, I got I got, I got my light, yep. I got my camera over there, and I had to carry all of these things with me. So it takes some level of. Uh, discomfort to pursue your interest and some people don't want to do that and i think and you're an example of this you have to push past the gap of being really shit at something too i'm not uh like let me let me connect that to an interview i am not in any way saying you're not good at it because you're really good at this i am very uncomfortable i do not like the public speaking side of no i'm uh, i'm definitely not that good compared to other people that i look up to but for me and I think probably is one of the characteristics that you that you've seen in a lot of people that you've interviewed. I, there is somehow there is something about podcasting that I love. It's just talking to people and, yeah. and just discovering about their own stories. But I like the medium. Like I like to call right. awfully call myself one future like a podcaster. I love. Yeah, but see, that's I lo- even that's I the, went to London can... and on Sunday I thought, okay, what are, what am I going to do on Sunday? So what I did was. I went to like a random American accent training and I met this lady. Her name is Victoria. She's amazing. And now I'm going to take some private coaching with her. But I just love that. Now, I don't know yet how all of this is going to turn into something in the future. But you gave me the inspiration that like just drip, 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 multiple over a long period of time. And then hopefully somehow, because maybe luck plays also a role, maybe hopefully one day you will make a splash. Yeah. I mean, to get, to connect that to the quote I was about to tee up, I think a lot of people can, I articulate like, Oh, this is interesting, but I'm not skilled at it. And I think that one of my favorite interviews, which connects to your interest, uh, Mm -hmm. is a guy named Ira Glass. Are you familiar with this American life? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Like he's like before yeah, he, podcasting was podcasting, he like defined like mm-hmm. what radio and then podcasting became in many, many ways. And the thing that was so meaningful to me was he talked about the need to wade through the gap between this time where you know what you want to do, mm-hmm. but you're not very good at it. And he talked mm-hmm. about like when he first edited radio and first did some radio pieces on NPR. And actually when we interviewed him, he was in the control room and he was able to pull up these like very early interviews that he had. Um, And he played some of them and he's like, there is no hint Mm -hmm. at all that I am any good. 
Like literally he, I think he had somebody say like, that's the worst like piece I've ever heard of like somebody trying yeah. to get on radio. And what he talked about was this, this chasm, this gap between that time when you don't have the skill, but you have the ear. Like he, he knew what good was, but he didn't mm -hmm. have the skill to get there. And so many times we abandon that interest because it's novelty or because it doesn't feel right because we haven't put in that time to like get to the place where the skill feels right. Right. You know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about that, like yeah. 2000 hours before you feel like you're competent. Yeah. Right. I think taking on that new sport of foiling, like I fell constantly for three months yeah. and it didn't feel all that good. 